Hello, God bless. Um, I wanted to discuss a uh, text that's come out. Uh, I don't know if it's gone what I would call mainstream or not, but it's it's a letter from Pilate to to Caesar in Rome. Uh, I find the letter very intriguing. I find, in fact, I find the interaction between Jesus and Caesar extremely intriguing. Uh, the reason I find it intriguing is okay. So we've all or most of us have put out videos or witnessed to brothers and sisters or tried to warn, tried to show people what's to come and all these different things. And we've all tried different, I call it different bait because we're fishers of men. So, you know, uh, you throw your bait out, you try to get someone to bite, you try to bring up a topic or you try to discuss something and you see if they want to take it a little further or not. Um, and I don't know about your experience, but it's been very, very, very few and far between anybody who's even interested in the bait. And uh, I, I use that term loosely because it's not bait. It's just, it's the word, it's the truth. And people are really reluctant to, to, to want to know more, to investigate the bait further, if you will. Uh, it's, it's really bothersome to me. And it's, it's been extremely, extremely depressing to me. Uh, the what I find interesting about the, in, the interaction between Jesus and Caesar is this, is he asks Jesus. He, you remember, this guy's in charge of all of Judea. Uh, he is a Roman dignitary, a Roman politician, uh, former centurion turned uh, prefect. Uh, he asks Jesus, this man who's standing before him in probably rags, uh, a crown of thorns, beaten, um, what is truth? And you could say maybe he was being sarcastic or maybe he was being uh, condescending. Uh, who knows? The flavor I get from reading this is he was generally interested in what is the truth? What are you trying to say? What is really the meaning to life? What is... Uh, your purpose. Who are you? What are you? Where do you come from? Uh, and it just, the interaction here just really strikes home with me for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe it doesn't with you. It does with me. And and Jesus tells him essentially, you know, to this end I was born. This is why I'm here, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone should hear my voice. And everyone that is a witness to the truth hears my voice. And Pilate says, what is truth? We don't know what happened after this. What did Jesus say? What did he answer? According to the word of God, it doesn't sound like much. But you learn a little bit about Pilate in this letter. And the letter I'm talking about is called the historic letter written by Pontius Pilate to Tiberius Caesar. Now, there's many conjectures of where this came from. And I'll tell you the one that I read that seems to agree with me is, a curator at the museum or at the uh, library in the Vatican uh, had a constant customer who kept coming in and, and he granted him more and more freedoms the longer he went, five, six, ten years. And eventually he got access to some of the documents of Rome. Uh, this letter came up. He wasn't even a religious man. He just kind of looked at it, said it was interesting. Eventually he writes back after years later uh, and gets a copy of it and he keeps on to that copy and eventually his friends convince him to release it, and it gets released. There's several different things on the, uh, the internet that uh, downplay this. We're going to talk about that for a second. You can get on here, and you can go to all different kinds of websites, Christianity websites even, and they will debunk this letter all day long. And there's different reasons for their debunking. Anybody can de debunk anything. We should know this through Snopes. I mean, they'll come flat out and make excuses after excuses and give you a long line of crap. It's, you know, you know, you can come up with anything. You can. If you get enough time and whatever, you can write anything you want to debunk anything. So again, you got to take these things back to the Word of God in prayer and, and see what the Holy Spirit tells you. And that's who you need to listen to. Um, I know Psalm 119 Ministries, they put out a video recently about uh, the authentic, authentic authenticity of the book of Enoch and they go through this whole elaborate spiel of who wrote it and when it was written and 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 don't get me wrong I don't find any validity in Enoch 2 and 3 but Enoch 1 I definitely do 
And it's the Holy Spirit that leads you to that truth and understanding. It's, it's not men, okay? Um, so I just wanted to come on here, give the letter, uh, go through it, just highlight a few things, and let you kind of be the judge of it and see if you find the, uh, the wonderful things I found in it that really reconcile with my spirit. And that's what we're going to do. First off, when reading this letter, it is extremely well written. The guy is smart. Pontius Pilate is a definitely educated person uh, in this letter. The words he uses, the descriptions, the tones, it is extremely well written. And um, just a very, very um, different... I'm not saying Pontius Pilate was a good person. I, I don't know. Um, but the interaction he has with Jesus and the way he kind of talks to Jesus, as you'll see here in, in a minute, is just... It's very interesting. That's that's how I'm gonna how I'm gonna put it, I guess, for right now. Um, I think there's more love for Pontius Pilate than we think, and less love for his own government and his own quote unquote religious system of Judea uh, at the time. So here we go. He goes on to say, the events in the last few days in my providence have been in such character that I will give you the details in full as they occurred, as I would, as I should not be surprised if, and in the course of time, they may change the destiny of our nation. For it seems of late that all the gods have ceased to be propitious to, propitious. I'm almost ready to say, cursed be the day that I succeeded Valerius Falconus in the government of Judea, for since then my life has been continual uneasiness and distress. So right away he's telling his boss uh, something's going on and this is just, this place sucks. And it's been continual turmoil since I've taken this position here in Judea. In this paragraph here, okay, he says, Upon my arrival, I took possession of the Praetorium and I ordered a splendid feast to all prepared, to which I invited the Tetrarch of Galilee. He invited all the higher arcs of that area, the high priests and all the officers. At their appointed hour, nobody showed up. So they stood him up. Essentially, he prepared this gravid, you know, feast for everybody uh, to come in, uh, probably establish some, some, some things, some policies and politics, and no one showed up. It was considered an insult to my, to my dignity and the whole government which I re represent a few days later, he talks about a high priest came to pay me a visit, and his deportment was grave and deceitful. He pretended that his religion forbade him and his attendants to sit at a table of the Romans and eat and offer libations with them. But this was only sacrimonious seeming, for his very countenance betrayed his hypocrisy. So he knows he's lying. He, he, he's very smart, this guy, um, and goes on to say, at that moment, he says, I was convinced that the conquered have declared themselves the enemy of the conquerors, and I would warn the Romans to beware of the high priests of this country, that they would that they would betray their own mother to gain office and a luxurious living. It seems to me that of conquered cities, that of conquered cities, Jerusalem is the most difficult to govern. So turbulent are the people that I live in momentary dread of an insurrection. I have not the soldiers sufficient to suppress it. He's only got one centurion and a few hundred men at this point. Okay, I requested reinforcement from Syria, who informed me that he had scarcely troops sufficient enough to defend his own providence. And then he kind of makes a, an accusation to Caesar, not really an accusation, but essentially, have we, have we grown so big that we can't control the lands that we've conquered? Um, and uh, he kind of sets the tone with that. So here he, he goes on to say he meets Jesus, or hears of him. So among the various rumors that came to my ears, there was one in particular that attracted my attention. A young man, it was said, appeared in Galilee, preaching with a noble unction, a new law, and the name of the God who sent him. At first I was apprehensive that this design was to stir up the people against the Romans. Of course, any military commander 
That's the first thing they're going to think of, you know. But my fears were soon dispelled. Jesus of Nazareth spoke rather as a friend of the Romans than the Jews. One day in passing by the place of Shiloh, and he goes on to say he sees a multitude of people gathered around Jesus, and he describes Jesus uh, with golden colored hair and a beard that gave him appearance of a celestial aspect. And he describes him a little bit further, you know, 30 years old, and, and the people that were around him were, you know, kind of common people. And he says, I was unwilling to interrupt him with my presence. I continued to walk, but I signaled my secretary. And his secretary's name is Milanus. And he's going to have Milanus kind of listen in. And uh, Milanus happens to know Hebrew. So he uh, has him stay there and kind of collect intel, if you will. So Milanus reports back to him and says, essentially, you know, this is what he said. And Caesar replies, never have I read the works of the philosophers or anything that compared compare to the maxims of Jesus. One of the rebellious Jews, so numerous in Jerusalem, having asked Jesus, was it lawful to give tribute to Caesar? He replied, render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and unto God that are God's. It was on this account of his sayings that I granted him so much liberty to the Nazarene, for it was in my power to have him arrested and exiled to Pontius. But that would have been contrary to the justice which we've always uh, been characterized by in the dealings with men. This man was neither sedacious nor rebellious. I extended to him my protection, unknown perhaps to himself. So in other words, he protected him even though, well, first off, Jesus didn't need his protection, but of course, Caesar obviously protected him in some way, shape, or form. He was at liberty to act, to speak, to assemble, to address, and choose the disciples unrestrained by any Praetorian mandate. And we see evidence of this because Jesus did. He went to these places. He gathered people. He spoke. He addressed. He went to the. He assembled and and acted, uh, and he chose followers. Pilate goes on to say, "This unlimited freedom granted to Jesus provoked the Jews, not the poor, but the rich and powerful." It is true. Does this sound familiar? This is probably what's going to be happening in might be even happening today. It is true that Jesus was severe on the latter, and that his political reason, in my opinion, for not restraining the liberty of the Nazarene, the scribes and Pharisees, he would say to them, you are a race of vipers, you resemble painted sepulchers. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that word. You appear well unto men, but you have death within you. At times he would sneer at the alms of the rich and proud, telling them that their might of the poor was more precious in the sight of God. Complaints were made daily. Complaints were made daily at the Praetorium against the insolence of Jesus. So again, he's doing something to obviously help Jesus at this point. I was, I was even informed that some misfortune would befall him, and that it would not be the first time that Jerusalem had stoned those who called themselves prophets. An appeal would be made to Caesar. However, my conduct was approved by the Senate, and I was promised reinforcement after determination of the Parthian War. So he's going to get more troops, and uh, he complained to the Senate, and it was approved. So this is where it gets interesting. What Pilate says here to Caesar is, Being too weak to suppress such an insurrection, I resolved in adopting a measure that promised to restore the tranquility of the city, without subjecting the Praetorium to humiliating concession. I wrote Jesus, requesting an interview with him at the Praetorium. He came. And he goes on to say this. He goes, you know that I'm full of Spanish and Roman blood, incapable of fear, as it is a week of emotion. But when the Nazarene made his appearance, I was walking in the Basilica, and my feet seemed fastened with iron, with an iron hand to the marble pavement. And I trembled in every limb, as does a guilty culprit. Though the Nazarene was calm and as innocence itself, when he came up to me, he stopped. And by a signal, he seemed to say, I am here. So you have this, this is a, a subordinate telling his Caesar that he was a little nervous when Jesus walked in. So it's very interesting. 
for some time I contemplated with admiration and awe this extraordinary type of man, a type unknown to our numerous painters who have who have been given the form and figure of all the gods and heroes. Jesus of Nazareth, for the last three years, I've granted you ample freedom of speech. So he, he speaks to Jesus and he says, essentially, I've, I've given you all this, this freedom to do what you're doing. And he doesn't regret it. Now, little does Caesar know that Jesus has this freedom to begin with. It's the will of the Father. Your words are those of a sage. I know whether or not you have read Socrates or Plato, but this I know, that there is discourses of a majestic simplicity that elevates you far above those philosophers. The emperor is informed of it, and I, his humble representative in this country, am glad of having allowed you that liberty of which you are worthy. However, I must not conceal from you that your discourses have raised up against you a powerful enemy. And this, of course, is the church, right? The synagogues, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Socrates had his enemies and fell victim to their hatred. Yours are double incensed against you on an account of your discourses of being so severe upon their conflict and against me on account of the liberty I have afforded you. They even accuse me of being indirectly leagued with you for the purpose of depriving the Hebrews of the little civil power which Rome has left them. My request, I do not say in order, is this, that you circumspect, circumspect and moderate your disclosures in the future. Lest you arouse the pride of your enemies and they raise up against you the stupid populace and compel me to employ the instruments of law. So he's telling Jesus, basically, you need to be quiet or it's going to come down on both of us. I've given you this freedom to do what you're doing, but it's starting to come back. And it's it's coming back in a way that's going to be detrimental to either you or, well, it won't be me, essentially. It'll be to you. But the Nazarene calmly replies and says, Prince of the earth, your words proceed not from true wisdom. Save the storm, stop in the midst of the mountain gorge, and it will uproot the trees of the valley. The storm will answer you and say that it obeys the laws of nature and the Creator. God alone knows whether to flow the waters of the torrent. Verily I say unto you, the rose of Sharon blossoms the blood. Blossoms, the blood of the just shall be split. And he says, Pilate replies, Your blood shall not be split. You are more precious in my estimate of account of your wisdom than all the turbulent and proud Pharisees who abuse the freedom granted to them by the Romans. They conspire against Caesar and convert his bounty into fear, impressing the unlearned that Caesar is a tyrant and seeks their ruin. Insolent wretches, they are not aware that the wolf of Tiber comes clothed himself with the skin of sheep to accomplish his wicked designs. I will protect you against them. My praetorium shall be an asylum both day and night. And Jesus shakes his head and says, When the day shall come, there will be no more asylums for the Son of Man, neither in the earth nor under the earth. The asylum of the just is there, pointing to the heavens, which is written in the books of the prophets must be accomplished. Pilate says this, essentially, Young man, you oblige me to convert my request into an order. The safety of the province which has been confided to my care requires it. You must observe more moderation in your disclosures. Do not infringe my order. You know the consequences. May happiness attend you. Farewell. And again, Jesus replies, I did not, I, I come not to bring war into the world, but peace, love, and charity. I was born the same day on which Augustus Caesar gave peace to the Roman world. It's an interesting date, by the way, if you want to look that up. Um, Persecutions proceeded not from me. I expect it from others. I will meet it in obedience to the will of my Father who has shown me the way. Restrain, therefore, your worldly prudence. It is not in your power to arrest the victim at the foot of the tabernacle expitation. Saying this, he disappeared and left. Okay, in this paragraph here, it talks about with Herod. Um, with uh, Pontius Pilate and Herod's interaction. Then here it comes towards the uh, the Passover. The great feast of the Jews was approaching, and the intention was to avail themselves 
uh, of the popular exaltation, which is, which always manifests itself at the solemnities of Passover. The city was overflowing with tumultuous populace, clamoring for the death of the, Naz the, the Nazarene. My emissaries informed me that the treasure of the temple had been employed in bribing the people. The danger was pressing. The Roman centurion was insulted, and I wrote to the prefect of Syria again, asking for more uh, troops. He declined. So he has a handful of veterans in the midst of a rebellious city, city too weak to suppress an uprising, having no choice left but to tolerate it. They had seized upon Jesus in the sedacious rabble, although they had nothing uh, to fear from the Praetorium, believing that their leaders had told them that I winked at their sedation, continuing to crucify him, crucify him. Three powerful parties had combined together at the time against Jesus. The, Herodos, the Herodians, the Sadducees, which are the Sadducees, um, uh, the, uh, it goes on to say here, just trying to paraphrase a little bit, um, the Pharisees, was the other group anyway he talks about those three okay so continuing Jesus is condemned to death he was dragged before me the high priest and condemned to death he was then at the high priest Caiaphas performed a divisionary act of submission he sent his prisoner to me to com to confirm and condemn and secure his execution his execution I answered that Jesus was Galilean, the affair came under Herod's jurisdiction, and ordered him to be sent there. Uh, the wily Tetrarch professed humility in protesting his defense, his difference to the lieutenant of Caesar. He committed the fate of the hand of the man to my hands. Soon my palace assumed the aspect of a besieged citadel. Every moment increased the number of malcontents. Jerusalem was inundated with crowds from the mountains of Nazareth. All Judea appeared to be pouring into the city. What you see, it, I think, here is a spiritual manifestation occurring in the city of, of the enemy. Every, every spirit was aroused because they knew who this was, and they wanted him put on that cross. They wanted to kill him, but they didn't know why they wanted to. They didn't know it was part of God's plan is what I'm saying. And then it talks about his wife. So his wife, we know, most of us know the story. Uh, she comes in and uh, tells him about a dream. Beware, do not touch that man for he's holy. I saw in a vision, walking on water, flying on the wings of the wind. He spoke to the tempests and the fishes. All were obedient. So... Um, Essentially, she is uh, telling him, do not harm this man. He is a holy man. We know this port here, death of the Nazarene. What was the crime? He blasphemed. Roman justice, I said, punishes not the offenses, not such offenses with death. And then we have crucify him, crucify him. Again. The infuriated mob. He goes on to destroy this mob, or he goes on to describe this mob, mob, very, very eloquently. Pilate says, "You know, I even tried their own um, doctrine uh, to be a scapegoat. Uh, there was, in other words, letting the prisoner go uh, for good measure, setting him free. Uh, they said that Jesus must be crucified, and." I then spoke to them of the inconsistency of their course as being incomparable with their laws, showing that no criminal judge could pass sentence on a criminal unless he had fasted for one whole day. So essentially, Pilate's kind of like using their own religion against them, their own doctrine against them. And um, that no criminal can be executed on the same day of his sentence. And uh, the St. Henry was required to review the whole proceedings, all these different things. And essentially, even though he's bringing up all these points of contention against crucifying him, they keep saying, crucify him, crucify him. So, I then ordered Jesus to be scourged, hoping that this might satisfy them, but has only increased their fury. I then called for a basin and washed my hands in the presence of the clamorous multitude, thus testifying that in my judgment, 
Jesus of Nazareth had done nothing deserving of death, but in vain. It was his life these wretches thirsted for. This is interesting right here. Often in our civil commotions, I have, I have witnessed the furious anger of the multitude, but nothing would be compared to what I witnessed on this occasion. This is a spiritual thing going on. It might have been truly said that all the phantoms in infernal regions had assembled at Jerusalem. The crowd appeared not to walk, but to be borne off and whirled as a vortex, rolling around, uh, I'm sorry, rolling along in living waves from portals of the Praetorium, even Mount Zion, with howling screams, shrieks, and vocal liferations, such as were never heard in the sedations of Pinoya or the tumults of the Forum. I'd have to research what that means, but someone who's a history buff might know. So the way he describes this crowd is is supernatural to me, uh, to Caesar, how he describes it. By degrees, the day darkened like a winter's twilight, such as, such as had been at the death of the great Julius Caesar. It was like, uh, likewise the Ides of March. I, the continued governor of a rebellious province, was leaning against a column in my basilica, contemplating athwart the decree gloom these friends of these fiends of Tartarus dragging to execution the innocent Nazarene. All around me was deserted. Jerusalem had vomited forth her indwellers through the funeral gates that leads to Germanica. Um, an air of desolation of sadness enveloped me. My guards had joined the cavalry and the centurion with a distressed play of power was endeavoring to keep order. I was left alone, and my breaking heart abonished me that was passing at that moment appertained rather to the history of the gods than that of men. A loud clamor was heard proceeding from Golgotha, which borne on the winds seemed to announce an agony such as never heard by mortal ears. Dark clouds lowered over the pinnacle of the temple, and setting over the city covered it with it as a veil. So dreadful were the signs that men saw both in the heavens and the earth, and on the earth, Dionysus the Aeropagate is reported to have explained either the author of nature is suffering or the universe is falling apart. While these appalling scenes of nature were transpiring, there was a dreadful earthquake in Lower Egypt which filled everyone with fear and scared the superstitious Jews almost to death. It is said Bathazar, an aged and learned Jew of Antioch, was found dead after the excitement was over. Whether he died from alarm or grief, it is not known. He was a strong friend of the Nazarene. Near the first hour of the night, I threw my mantle around me and went down to the city toward the gates of Golgotha. The sacrifice was consummated. The crowd was returning home. Still agitated, it is true, but gloomy, taciturn, and desperate. What they had witnessed had stricken them with terror and remorse. Here it talks about Joseph coming to uh, request the body of Jesus. And um, he grants it. So he finds the tomb essentially empty. So here we go with the, uh, the resurrection. After a few days after the speculature was found empty, the disciples proclaimed all over the country that Jesus had risen from the dead as he foretold. This created more excitement than the crucifixion. And to its truth, I cannot say for certain, but I have made some investigation of the matter so you can examine for yourself to see if I'm at fault as Herod represents. Jesus, or Joseph buried Jesus in his own tomb. Whether he contemplated his resurrection or calculated to cut him another, I cannot tell. The day after he was buried, one of the priests came to me and, and obviously wanted the, the tomb guarded because uh, the resurrection was foretold and, and the, they feared that the disciples would do some sort of trick. So essentially, uh, Pilate does grant a hundred soldiers, it says here somewhere, 
grants 100 soldiers and a, and a lieutenant uh, named uh, Ben Isham with 100 soldiers around the speculature. He told me that the soldiers were very much alarmed at what occurred there that morning. I sent for this man who related to me as near as I can recollect the following circumstances. He said that at about the beginning of the fourth watch, he saw a soft, beautiful light over the speculature. He at first thought the women had come to embalm the body of Jesus, as was their custom, but he could see, but he could not see how they had gotten through the guards. While the, these thoughts were passing through his mind, behold, the whole place was lit up, and there seemed to be crowds of dead uh, in their grave clothes. All seemed to be shouting and filled with ecstasy, while all around and above was the most beautiful music he had ever heard, and the whole air seemed to be full of voices praising God. That's beautiful. At this time there seemed to be a reeling and swimming of the earth, so that he turned so sick and faint that he could not stand on his feet. He said the earth seemed to swim from under him, and his senses left him, so that he knew not what did occur. I asked him if he could not have been mistaken as to the light. He said, was it uh, not day coming from the east? And he said, at first I thought that, but at a stone's cast, it was exceedingly dark. He then remembered it was too early for day. I asked him if his dizziness might not have come from being awakened and getting up too suddenly, as it sometimes has this effect. He said he was not, and that he had been in, uh, not been asleep all night as the penalty of death for, uh, it was the penalty of death for sleeping on duty. Um, he said he had let some of the soldiers sleep at that time. Some were asleep then. I asked him how long the scene lasted, and he said he did not know, but he thought it was nearly an hour. Um, he says, I asked if I went to the speculature after it had come to himself. He said no, because he was afraid that just as soon as relief came, they all went to those to their quarters. I asked him if they had been questioned by the priest, and he said that they had, that they wanted them to say that the earth, that it was an earthquake, and that they were asleep, and offered him money to say that the disciples came and stole Jesus. But we saw no disciples. He did not know that the body was gone until he was told. I asked him, <laughs> this is awesome, I asked him what was the, the private opinion of those priests he had uh, conversed with. He said that some of them thought that Jesus was no man, that he was not a human being, and that he was not the son of Mary, that he was not the same that was said to be born of the Virgin of Bethlehem, that the same person had been on earth before with Abraham and Lot and many other times and places. It seemed to me that if the Jewish theory be true, these conclusions are correct for they are in accord with the man's life, as it is known and testified by both friends and foes, for the elements were no more in his hands than the clay of the potter. He talks about water to wine and changing the, the you know, healing the sick and all the, the, uh, the miracles he did, uh, obviously not criminal offenses, nor was he charged with violating any law. Um, and this is where it gets really neat. I am almost ready to say, as did Manus at the cross, truly this was the Son of God. Um, and this closes with this now noble sovereign this is as near as the facts in the case as I can arrive at and I have taken pains to make the statement very full so that you may judge of my conduct upon the whole as I hear Antipater has said many hard things of me of, in this matter with the promise of faithfulness and good wishes to my noble sovereign, I am your obedient servant, Pontius Pilate. Anyway, guys, I found this very, very interesting. And I often wonder if Pilate did eventually know the truth, which he asked Jesus himself for. And... Um, It'd be interesting to see. I think this letter brings a lot of validity to things that, um, well, it brings a lot of validity. It's the it's the whole account by C by Pilate himself. 
So anyway, guys, God bless. Discern as you see with prayer. Amen.